Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading from Acts 16, 13 through 19. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul out and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour, the word of the Lord. Uh, I mentioned last week that uh, in our modern Western culture, uh, more and more people are rejecting traditional institutional religion. But that doesn't mean people don't believe in God or have spiritual longings. Most people do. But here's the rub for us modern people. At a surface level, God as a concept is still present in our society. But at a deeper level, God as a living reality is less and less there. And most of the time, we don't even notice it. And and we see this everywhere in our culture. It's in our books, our movies, our TV shows. It's everywhere. For instance, The Hunger Games is based on ancient Rome. And if we were to time transport an ancient Roman to our modern world and sit them down in front of a movie screen, they would immediately recognize this. An ancient Roman would look at the Hunger Games and say, aha, a worldwide empire of peace, but it's built on the brutal oppression of all the outlying districts where any hint of rebellion is immediately crushed. Any ancient Roman would look at that and say, check. Or they would see a capital city full of lavish decadence and gluttonous feasts and outlandish hairstyles and makeups, and large-scale gladiatorial contests where combatants are forced to fight to the death, any ancient Roman would look at that and say, check. But what's the motto of the games? What do they tell the contestants? May the odds be ever in your favor. To us, this makes perfect sense, but any ancient Roman would look at this and say, wait, what? Uncheck. Why? Because in the ancient world, it wasn't the odds, but the gods who controlled every aspect of your life. In the ancient world, there was nowhere you could go and nothing you could do to escape the intervention of the gods in your life and in this world. In ancient Rome, the motto would have been, may the gods be ever in your favor. But we live in a world that has replaced the gods with the odds, and we don't even notice. In the ancient world, it would have been, may the gods be ever in your favor. We don't even notice that this is going on, that that we've replaced this in our world. Because in the ancient world, there was nothing you could do to escape the influence of the gods. So in our world, um, all the happiness and meaning and purpose and flourishing that we're looking for is um, supposedly found in luck, a combination of luck. May the odds be ever in your favor. And whatever skill you can bring to the table, you got to have game. And yet, our spiritual hunger never goes um, away. Um, Our most common experience of God in this world is an experience of God's absence. Is there anything we can do about that? What do we do about that? We're in a series in the book of Acts which tells the story of the early church. Um, In this passage, Acts chapter 16 tells the stories of three people who experienced the radical intervention of God. We're going to look at the first two stories this week, the story of a businesswoman named Lydia 
and a slave girl. Next week, we'll look at the story of this Roman jailer, but three people who experienced the radical intervention of God. Let's look at this passage this week and see what it shows us about God's intervention in this world. We're going to see the emptiness of the world, the oppression of evil, and the intervention of Jesus, okay? The emptiness of the world, the oppression of evil, and finally, the intervention of Jesus, all right? First, uh, this passage shows us the emptiness of the world. Um, In this passage, Paul and his colleagues arrive in the Roman city of Philippi. And whenever Paul would get to a new place, the first thing that he would do would be to look for a synagogue or some other gathering of Jews where he could set up a base of operations. Now, in Philippi, it doesn't appear that there were any synagogues, but they do find some women out by the river praying. And so they start talking to them about Jesus. Notice it says, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Now, we learn some important things about Lydia right here. First of all, she's a businesswoman. She is a seller of purple goods. Purple goods was cloth that was dyed purple. It was a very expensive process, which means that only the wealthiest of people could afford the purple cloth. In the ancient world, people walking around in purple cloth was like people today walking around in Christian Louboutin shoes and toting coach bags. Um, In other words, Lydia is not just any businesswoman. She is an extremely wealthy, highly successful businesswoman. She is a clothier to the stars. But even more importantly, it says that Lydia was a worshiper of God. Now, this is a technical term that shows up a lot in the book of Acts. It's often translated God-fearer. A God-fearer was a Gentile or non-Jewish person who was interested in the God of the Bible, but who hadn't converted to Judaism. In other words, this is someone who is spiritually curious, but not fully committed. And you don't have to think about that very long to realize, wow, there's a lot of people like that in our world. Maybe some of you. You have spiritual longings, um, spiritually curious about many things, and yet you wouldn't call yourself a religious person. Um, But here's the thing about Lydia. Uh, She's also someone, as a a God-fearer, someone who would have left behind the polytheism of her Greek culture. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Ancient Greek religion worshipped multiple gods, and if you wanted the gods to be in your favor, then you had to sacrifice to those gods. For instance, if you wanted a successful crop, you would sacrifice to the god of the harvest. If you wanted lots of children, you sacrificed to the god of fertility. Or if you wanted a successful business, you sacrificed to the god of commerce. As a God-fearer, Lydia has left all of that behind. Now think about this for just a moment. Lydia has all of the success in this world a person could ask for. And yet, not only is she experiencing the emptiness of worldly success, she's also experiencing the emptiness of Uh, all the spiritual gods that were available to her in her culture. Um, In other words, Lydia sees both the emptiness of the world and worldly success, but she also sees the emptiness of other spiritual options. Why? Because in her culture, all of that was entirely focused on human flourishing in this world only. In other words, um, she sees the emptiness of, of, of her business life. It's completely focused on money, power, status, success in this world, but she also sees the emptiness of all the other spiritual options in her culture, which were also entirely focused on human flourishing in this world, and all of that was leaving her empty. Otherwise, she would not have been seeking for something more in the God of the Bible. Here's what this means for us. As we've just seen, for ancient people, uh, spiritual reality was an inescapable part of their daily lives. There was nowhere you could go, nothing you could do to to escape the intervention of the gods in that world. And yet, the intervention was always focused on human flourishing in this world. But for us modern people, uh, we have a picture of reality that God could be real, 
but God might also not be real. Uh, for ancient people, it was impossible to escape spiritual reality, but for we modern people, it's impossible to escape spiritual doubt. Even if you believe in God. Here's the point. If ancient people who did believe in the gods were still entirely focused on human flourishing in this world, then how much more are we modern people, are we modern scientific, technological, consumeristic people entirely focused on human flourishing in this world? And yet it leaves all of us empty. Uh, because everything in this world, even if you believe in spiritual reality, even if you're open to that possibility, our culture is constantly training us to think of spirituality as a lifestyle choice or a consumer option. Um, it's, it's constantly training us to look at spirituality as something that helps us find, as we say, something that works for you. And especially, it trains us to, um, to, to seek something that works for us to help us to discover and to express our authentic individual selves to the world around us. So, for instance, think about the various spiritual options available in our culture. For instance, astrology is all about predicting the future so you can be happy in this world. Or Wicca and modern witchcraft very often have a, a profound focus in our culture on political activism in this world. Even mindfulness meditation is marketed as a way of boosting efficiency and optimizing productivity. Where? In this world. Or even many modern expressions of Christianity in contemporary America are oftentimes focused entirely on human flourishing in this world. Christian nationalism makes a god out of the nation. Or um, uh, the prosperity gospel makes a god out of health and wealth in this world. Many forms of Christian activism make a god out of political action in this world. And even purity culture makes a god out of sexual abstinence and marriage in this world. Now some of you may be thinking, whoa, Eric, you are really down on the world, aren't you? <laughs> Let me be clear about something. Uh, God created this world, and he called it good. The problem is not this world. The problem is not creation. Human flourishing in this world is a good thing. Having a healthy identity in this world is a really good thing. We could say it like this. The world is good, but friends, the world is not God. And if we live for anything in this world aside from God, if we seek our ultimate good in anything in this world other than God, then not only are we instrumentalizing God and turning God into a tool to help us find a happy life in this world, but we will also always be perpetually empty because we'll be living for things that, that can never satisfy the deepest desires of our heart. Don't you ever feel that? Lydia is at a place in her life where she's beginning to realize this. She sees the emptiness of human flourishing only in this world, but also the emptiness of um, living for other spiritual options in this world other than the God of the Bible. She sees that, um, that human flourishing in this world only is good, but it's not God. She's missing something. She's looking for something more. How does she find it? Well, before we find out, let's look at the next story. We've just seen the emptiness of this world. But secondly, this passage shows us the oppression of evil. Um, after Paul and his colleagues have been in Philippi for a while, it says this, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Now, what do we learn about this slave girl? Well, first... Slave girl is a good translation because she's probably no more than 14 years old. Second, she's oppressed by a demonic spirit. Now, for us modern people, this might sound primitive and superstitious. Uh, and we don't have time to go deep on this, but if you struggle with this idea, just consider this for a moment. Uh, many people in our culture believe in the possibility of supernatural reality. And most of us also believe in the reality of evil. So why would we not be open to at least the possibility of supernatural evil? But third, uh, not only is this uh, slave girl oppressed by 
uh, supernatural evil, she's also oppressed by human evil because she's a slave and her owners are exploiting her demonic oppression in order to make much gain off of her. Friends, this is a young girl who is being exploited, oppressed, and trafficked, and yet she experiences the, the radical power and inbreaking and intervention of God in her life. Now, just like Lydia, we'll look at how that happens in just a bit. But first, think about what this shows us about Christianity and the God of the Bible. We just mentioned that emptiness in this world is a problem. But we're also seeing that evil in this world is a problem. We know that evil in this world is a huge problem. In fact, I read people who deny the reality of evil. I talk to people who deny the reality of evil. And yet, I've never talked or met anybody who denies the reality of evil who doesn't still condemn evil when they see it. But here's the amazing thing about the gospel. Not only does the Bible offer us a flourishing that goes beyond this world, the Bible, and only the Bible, offers us a God who actually does something, who intervenes to rescue us from evil in this world. And I recognize that's a huge claim, but let me back that up a little bit. For instance, Frederick Douglass was a fierce abolitionist who was famous for condemning the moral evils of slavery and white supremacy. He was also really famous for his fierce condemnation of the religious hypocrisy of slave owners because they were all Christians. But what did Frederick Douglass say? Did he say, well, we got to get rid of Christianity, get rid of the church, get rid of the Bible? No. In fact, he said the opposite. Frederick Douglass was using the Bible to critique the evil of the Christian slave owners, because only in the Bible do you find moral categories like universal human rights and justice for the poor and the oppressed. So, for instance, if you look at other ancient moral codes, you will find the idea of rights, but not universal rights, not equal rights. Or if you look at ancient moral codes, you will find the idea of justice, but not justice for the poor not justice for the oppressed. Those things only, you will only find those things in the Bible. Now, some of you might think, well, Frederick Douglass was a Christian. He's biased. Okay, fair enough. But consider someone like Tom Holland, not the Spider-Man actor. <laughs> Tom Holland is a highly regarded uh, British historian uh, who wrote a book a few years ago called Dominion. It's all about how Christianity has shaped the moral imagination of our world for the last 2,000 years. Um, Tom Holland talks about a uh, number of modern moral movements that have occurred over the course of the last several decades. So towards the end of the book, he mentions things like the Civil Rights Movement, or Me Too, or the LGBTQ movement, or Black Lives Matter, or even the anti-abortion movement. All of those moral movements, are, have, they have a special concern for the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. Now, here's the thing. Tom Holland is talking as a historian. He's not a Christian. He's not trying to convert people to Christianity. He's not advocating for Christianity. He's just being honest about history and yet one of the things he notes is that all of these moral movements, which we think are so modern and enlightened and progressive and new, are not actually new. All of them have their roots in the Bible and would be impossible to imagine without the Bible. So here's how he puts it in the book. He's talking about the reality that, look, we live in a world where people have rejected Christianity. We've rejected religion. We think it's harmful and oppressive. And yet, he says... The trace elements of Christianity continued to infuse people's morals and presumptions so utterly that many failed even to detect their presence. Like dust particles, so fine as to be invisible to the naked eye, they were breathed in equally by everyone, believers, atheists, and those who never paused so much as to think about religion. Had it been otherwise, then no one would ever have got woke. Now, Here's the point. Only the Bible gives us a framework for condemning evil in this world, and 
Only the Bible gives us a God who actually intervenes to rescue us from evil in this world. And we see this in this passage. So, for instance, in the ancient world, and still in many parts of our modern world, women were and are seen as inferior to men. And yet, in this passage, when Lydia gets converted and becomes a Christian, the first church in the city of Philippi gets established at her household. She's the leader of the household. Does Paul say, oh, wait a minute, we better get a man to come lead this thing? No. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't other leaders involved in the church. Of course there were. But Lydia was the leader of her household. She was one of the leaders of the church. Friends, the Bible consistently undermines and subverts the misogyny and the hierarchy of both the ancient world and the modern world by empowering and dignifying women in this world. It, that's the reason that here at Central West End Church, women are elders. Women preach, women teach, women can do anything that a man can do, and we do that because of the Bible. Or, for instance, um, think about the slave girl. You know, um, it wasn't just women in the ancient world, but also slaves and children that were considered inferior in the ancient world. And yet, this slave girl is the special object of God's intervening power. Why? Because the Bible consistently undermines and subverts the oppression of the ancient world by empowering and dignifying um, the, the weakest and most vulnerable and marginalized members of society. It's consistently undermining the oppression of the ancient world by empowering and dignifying the oppressed of this world. Or, if you look at the structure of Acts chapter 16, the whole chapter is a profound critique um, against ancient attitudes towards gender, social status, and race. Now, for us modern people, it would be difficult to see, but any ancient pr person reading Acts chapter 16, I mean, it, it leaps off the page at them. Because there was a famous prayer of, that Jewish men would pray in the ancient world. Every day, Jewish men prayed, God, I thank you that you have not made me a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Acts chapter 16 is a huge in-your-face against that prayer. Because who are the people that get, get saved in this chapter? A woman, a slave, and a Gentile. We'll see his story next week. But friends, here's the point. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is saying in the strongest possible language that the gospel of Jesus Christ undermines and undoes the deepest, most entrenched systems of both human and supernatural evil in this world. How? Well, that leads to our last point. We've seen the emptiness of the world, and we've just seen the oppression of evil. But last, we see the intervention of Jesus. Now that we've looked at both of these stories, let's ask the question, how does God intervene in their lives, and what does it show about how God intervenes in our lives? So first, look at Lydia. Uh, Paul and his colleagues are at the river. They're talking to these women about Jesus. And then it says, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, this phrase, pay attention, is a word that uh, literally means to completely give yourself to something, to devote yourself to something. It captivates your mind, your heart, your imagination. You become completely absorbed with it. Lydia becomes absorbed and captivated by the gospel. But here's the thing. It's not Lydia who does it. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Here's what this means. Lydia has been going to the river. She's been praying, seeking God, reading the Bible, talking to other people who are doing the same thing. And yet, um, none of it really seems to click into place until God opens her heart to give her a whole new picture of who God really is and what the gospel is really is. And, and think about who Lydia is. This is somebody whose whole life revolves around beauty. Her whole life revolves around selling the most beautiful clothes to the most beautiful people. Her life revolves around beauty, and yet God opens her heart in this passage to see that Jesus is the true beauty she's been looking for the whole time, and it transforms her life. Maybe some of you are like Lydia 
You have spiritual longings. You feel the emptiness of this world. You are looking for something more, but you're also wary of Christianity because you have a picture of Christianity. Um, and, and you think because of that picture that this is what Christianity is really about. And, and there are things in that picture you have of Christianity that turn you off. Maybe you see Christianity as primitive and barbaric. Maybe you see it as harmful and depressive. Maybe you see it as irrational and um, superstitious. Maybe you see it as all of the above. You have all of these spiritual longings, and yet, so often, your experience of God in this world is one of an experience of God's absence in this world. And yet, one of the main things that this passage shows us is that one of the main ways God intervenes in our lives is by giving us a new picture of God. And only God can do it. But here's the really amazing thing about the gospel. You wouldn't be longing for God. You wouldn't be experiencing the emptiness of this world if God wasn't already at work opening your heart to who God is. Or we could say it like this. The experience of God's absence is a sign of his presence. The experience of God's absence is a very powerful sign of God's presence. You wouldn't be longing for God if he wasn't already opening your heart. So what is there for us to do about that in the midst of all of this? Go to the river. Seek God. Pray. Read the Bible. Talk to other people who are doing the same thing. And especially if you're exploring faith, I would encourage you to keep your heart open to the possibility that maybe you have a distorted picture of Christianity and you need God to give you a new picture of Christianity, a new picture of the gospel, a new picture of who God really is. Ask God to do that because he will. But second, look at the slave girl in this passage. Remember, she was not only oppressed by human evil, she was enslaved and oppressed by supernatural evil. If Lydia needed a new picture, this slave girl needs a new power. Maybe some of you are like this. Maybe you are um, enslaved and oppressed by, um, by a power that's greater than yourself. Maybe it's some kind of addiction. Maybe, um, maybe it's some kind of obsession like bitterness or resentment, fear, shame, grief, or something else. And, and, and it won't let go of you, but also you just can't let go of it. You hate it, but you also love it. You are enslaved and oppressed by it but you also give yourself to it. In other words, it is your Lord and it names you. But look at what happens to the slave girl in this passage. It says that Paul turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. This slave girl is oppressed by the power of something that had named her. But now a new power comes into her life, the power of Jesus' name. And, and when that power, when that name comes into her life, all the other powers flee. There is a new power at work in her life, a new name, the ultimate name of Jesus. Friends, one of the main things this passage is showing us is that it doesn't matter who you are. The gospel is for everybody because everybody needs the intervention of Jesus. It, there could be no more radical differences between Lydia and the slave girl. Um, and, and the Roman jailer, we'll look at his story next week. These are people that are radically different from each other, and yet they all need the intervention of Jesus in their lives. In other words, there is no one single personality type, psychological profile, social demographic, political party, or cultural background that tends toward the gospel and Christianity while others don't. No. Uh, this is showing us that everybody needs the gospel because everybody needs the intervention of Jesus. There is no one type or profile. Everybody needs the gospel, and the gospel is open to everybody because everybody needs the intervention of Jesus. So, for instance, maybe you're somebody who really feels the emptiness of life in this world. Maybe you're looking for some beauty, meaning, purpose, and fullness to come in and to meet you in the deepest longings of your heart. You need a new picture. Look at Jesus. In the ancient world, there was nothing more brutal and repulsive 
than crucifixion. That crucifixion was, was the most horrifying and grotesque thing anybody could imagine in the ancient world. So even in our modern world today, if you go to like Google Images, um, there are certain images like lynchings that, that will be blurred out if you go searching for them on Google Images because they're just so horrifying and grotesque. But the cross of Jesus gives us a whole new picture because when you look at Jesus on the cross, twisted, mangled, bloody, beaten, all of a sudden you get a new picture of true beauty. The beauty of a love so great that he would empty himself on the cross so that he could fill you with his love. The gospel gives you a new picture of beauty. But maybe you're somebody who really feels the burden of evil in this world. You're longing for something to rescue you to renew you, to transform you, to give you a new name in this world. You need a new power in your life. Look at Jesus. In the ancient world, there was nothing more shameful and degrading than crucifixion. It was considered a slave's death. Crucifixion was, was the, the way that the Roman Empire asserted the power of its name over the weakest and most vulnerable members of society, over the slaves of society. And yet, the cross of Jesus gives you a new power because when you look at Jesus on the cross, naked, degraded, hands and feet nailed to the cross, all of a sudden you see a new power. Because only on the cross do you see the power of a God so mighty that he would absorb the full firepower of evil in his own being in order to give you a new name and set you free from evil. Friends, if you're exploring faith, Go to the river. Seek God. Pray. Read the Bible. Talk to other people who are doing the same thing. And if you're somebody who really feels the burden of evil in this world, then just like this slave girl was constantly running after Paul, crying out, I would encourage you, follow Jesus and keep crying out after him. You wouldn't experience this longing for God, this experience of God's absence, if God wasn't already at work in your life, um, opening your heart to his presence in this world. So, so keep seeking him, keep chasing after him, and keep following after Jesus, crying out for rescue from evil. And understand something, that our full rescue from evil won't come until Jesus comes back to make all things new. For instance, the slave girl, even though she had been rescued, she still endured evil in this world. We will too. Um, and yet there was a new freedom and a new power in her life. And you can have the same thing too. Through Jesus, friends, have you seen this new picture? Have you received this new power? Seek God. Pray. Let God completely open up your heart to him and give you a new name in Jesus. You don't have to wonder if this is a God who's in your favor. Look at him on the cross dying for you. This is a God who is ever in your favor, and his name is Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the name of Jesus. We thank you for the picture of Jesus showing us who you really are. We thank you for the power of Jesus intervening in our lives and in this world. Father, we thank you for the intervention of Jesus, that even though this world is good, we live for human flourishing in this world, and it's leaving us empty. It's leaving us enslaved. And Father, it's ruining this world. It's ruining our lives, and especially it's, it's breaking and destroying our relationship with you. Father, I pray today that you would um, pour out an ever newer, clearer picture of Jesus into our hearts. I pray that you would pour out an ever more mighty um, salvation and power into our lives through the cross of Jesus. And I pray that you would send us out into this world and that we would be vessels um, of your gospel to this world, that through our lives we would give others a new picture of the gospel, and that through our lives others would experience the power of the gospel, Father. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.